Hello, everyone. This is Siddharth Damber, Chicago Arthritis and Care Medicine. Welcome to our webinar today. So we are talking about regenerative medicine treatments specifically for arthritis, tendinitis, injuries, and back pain. So I'll talk for 20, 30 minutes. Please ask your questions and I will answer them as we go along. My experience, this goes really much better and it goes really well if, if you ask your questions and I can, can answer as uh, in the flow of things as well. So what you will get from this webinar is the following. You'll learn about the best available treatments for arthritis and tendinitis that do not require surgery. It includes using your own bone marrow stem cells and blood platelet treatments. What is legitimate and not legitimate in the field of regenerative medicine? How to choose the best physicians and clinics for regenerative medicine treatments as well. So again, my name is Siddharth Thamber, physician here at Chicago Arthritis and Drive Medicine. After we're done, if you'd like to learn more about how we do things, please go to chicagoarthritis.com. So the big question is, what would you do if your pain was controlled? How would your life improve? What exercise would you restart? What activities with family and friends would you participate in again? So a bit about who I am. Again, Siddharth Thamber, physician here at Chicago Arthritis and Drive Medicine, specialist and board certified in rheumatology, specialist in image-guided musculoskeletal injections, in practice since 2008, practicing regenerative medicine as well since 2008, and within the Regenix Network since 2012. The Regenix Network is the largest network of affiliated physicians who are involved in regenerative medicine utilizing similar protocols, sharing data, best practices, and really pushing the field forward. My personal journey into regenerative medicine really started with my own shoulder. I played tennis competitively when I was in high school. Didn't really have any shoulder problems at that time. As I got older and in my fellowship training as a rheumatologist, I was had the opportunity to learn diagnostic musculoskeletal ultrasound. I noticed my own shoulder that I had some instability issues, a little bit of tendonitis issues. And even though I had pain at that time, and I did later on, it made me start to think about tendon and ligament issues very differently than I'd been taught. And in that process, it made me search for better options for musculoskeletal issues. And the reason why is that the traditional care, at least what I'd been taught traditionally and what is practiced traditionally, is that traditional care for tendonitis, tendon tear, sprains and strains, arthritis, joint pains, neck pain, back pain, is really just to mask the pain and waiting for eventual surgery. The, the comparison to, let's say, something like diabetes would be, or high blood pressure, would be wait until you've had your first heart attack or stroke before you do anything. And we would never do that in those other conditions, but we seem to do that for our own musculoskeletal care. So problems with traditional care are a lot. The pain medications can help temporarily, but they don't fix the problem. They have a lot of their own side effects. Traditional injections, including steroid injections and nerve blocks can give pain relief, but also the potential to weaken tissue, have other side effects and are really not really fixing the problem. They're just band-aids. Surgery appropriate in the right cases, but in the vast majority of musculoskeletal issues, they do not require surgery. Surgery on its own compared to non-surgical options has higher risk. It can accelerate the arthritis process if you're doing things like arthroscopy routinely where you're cutting out tissue. That can lead to more instability. And some of those arthroscopic procedures, such as knee arthroscopy, if you already have arthritis, have been proven not to be more effective than just either physical therapy or sham surgery. And so for those of us that are involved in regenerative medicine, we strongly feel that 80% of what's going to surgery right now, long-term, we should be able to avoid that. In the same way that 90 plus percent of what was handled with open heart surgery is now handled with needle-based procedures or medication management. So in searching for better options, we need options that are lower risk and avoid serious side effects that should treat the source of your problem. The source of your problem is instability or inflammation and metabolic issues. Improve the actual cause of the problem and give you long-term improvement. So imagine reducing your pain 
and getting back to the activities you care about without surgery or pain medications. So regenerative medicine is the process of utilizing your body's own cells to treat arthritis, tendonitis, injuries, and back pain. Again, I'm focused strictly on musculoskeletal issues. If you're interested in treating things like kidney problems and brain injuries and spinal cord injuries, then you know this, this is not the right webinar for you. That's not what I'm focused on. And frankly, there's very little evidence that um, these treatments can help with those conditions at this point. In the world of musculoskeletal conditions, however, there is good data to show that these treatments help. So in the normal healing process, such as let's say you take a small cut on your finger, you have platelets that infiltrate the area first, they first stop the bleeding, they then release growth factors, which then stimulate your local stem cells, causes inflammation, then starts a normal cellular repair process. That works great if you have good blood flow, let's say in muscles, in tissues with less blood flow, and that can include tendon, cartilage, ligaments, discs, labor, and meniscus. They tend not to heal very well on their own once they've been injured. They're very hardy tissues, but once they've been recurrently injured or too severely injured, they tend not to heal very well on their own. So regenerative medicine is the process of taking those same cells, your platelets and, and bone marrow stem cells, and then injecting those cells to coordinate the normal healing process in that tissue in order to recover. So why regenerative medicine? It treats the source of the problem, which is instability and inflammation, safer than surgery, effective for most musculoskeletal conditions, and again, should help you avoid surgery in the vast majority of cases. In cases where you need surgery, sometimes these treatments can actually be adjunctive or can actually add to the benefit of surgery. Let's say in the case of, let's say, a rotator cuff tear, but in the majority of cases, we are trying to actually avoid surgery. So how does regenerative medicine work? I've mentioned some of this. It optimize, optimizes the tissue that's in damage, the cellular health of the tissue. It improves the strength and stability of supportive soft tissue structures. We'll talk about that. That's called prolotherapy. Reduces chronic inflammation. of so many good cases of where a RA or psoriatic arthritis patient has been doing well, but has one or two residual joints that are problematic and these treatments have helped. And it can also improve the neuromuscular health around that tissue that can actually overall improve your pain and function as well. Before I get into this slide, again, if you have questions, please message them to us either through chat or Q&A, and I will answer them as things come up. So what makes a regenerative medicine expert there's a lot of folks who do these treatments, but there's very few who are properly doing this. And it really requires a number of different things in my experience. Number one, they should be a musculoskeletal expert. And what that means is that they should not be running from room to room doing random other things. Let's say treating erectile dysfunction in one room, hormone management in the next room, blood pressure in the next room, and then also treating your knee. That's not an expert. Medicine works by if you're focused on really one or two things. They should be a non-surgical musculoskeletal expert. Our surgical colleagues are trained very well in surgery. They generally are not trained on how to do these kind of treatments with high-level X-ray ultrasound guidance. And to do these pro procedures properly, image guidance should be used for all procedures. I have slightly older colleagues who will tell me that just by palpating the skin, they can inject things appropriately. And you know, my response is that, look, you have for these kind of treatments where you're injecting your own cell, you have to be so precise with your, your target. You have to be at a submillimeter level that you really cannot do that reliably with just your just blindly doing that. And until I have x-ray vision, I plan to use the x-ray machine and the ultrasound machine in the office to make sure that we're using image guidance to be very targeted. They should, your physician should understand how to use inflammation to help you heal. I see too many docs who do these treatments that are utilizing steroid injections kind of routinely and then saying, well, maybe we try these other treatments after that. And that, that doesn't, that's, it shows a lack of understanding how um, steroids, which are reducing inflammation, but it has a lack of understanding of, of how to really properly use, properly use these treatments. In addition, they should understand the different types of treatments that are available. You should not be a one size fits all kind of approach. They should understand that you need a personalized treatment, not a generic treatment. 
most of my colleagues will use sort of a generic kind of treatment approach where whatever your problem is, they're using one kit, make things one way without any flexibility. You don't, th that's not the right way to do this. And I'll kind of show that example later on. They should understand how to treat instability with prolotherapy. That's very key. A lot of physicians don't do that. I'll give some examples. They should be transparent regarding results and your candidacy for treatment. They, would, they should follow your results long-term. They should just they should not just be a, they treat you once and you never see them again. They should really follow up with this long-term and they should guide you through the process. These treatments are newer, 20 years old or so, but still they're newer and you know people do need some guidance when they're doing this. So some other basic questions, is this legal? Yes, there are strict guidelines from the FDA. If you follow the rules, these are legal. Those rules are, they need to be used for musculoskeletal conditions, not for non-MSK use. You need to use your own cells, not somebody else's living cells. And number three, once you've drawn the, the cells out, you need to use them within the same day. If you follow those rules, you're FDA compliant and doing this correctly. Another common question I get is, if I'm older, should I use someone else's cells? In the vast majority of cases, no, you should use your own cells. For most orthopedic conditions, there's very good evidence that using your own living cells is effective. The one exception is hips, where, um, um, where age may make a difference there. And so is there an age limit? Again, the answer is no for the vast majority of things. For hips, if you're over the age of 65, um, outcomes can be worse if you have significant arthritis. But use your own cells, please, and do this correctly. What sort of doctor does these treatments? Physician focus on musculoskeletal conditions. I talked about this, focus on non-surgical treatment and really understands how to be a proper regenerative medicine expert. Can these treatments help if I've already had surgery? Simple answer is yes, but there's some, there's some nuance to this, but generally, yes, it can still help. My general rules for orthopedic surgery is try to keep your own anatomy, avoid surgeries that cut out tissue only. That are not really fixing the problem, and always consider a regen med treatment option if you've been recommended surgery. So we're going to talk about some key concepts here. I see that there's a couple of questions that come through. Someone asks, why does an x-ray not show tissue recovery several years after a stem cell procedure? It's a good question. So x-rays have a certain amount of limitation, all right? There's only so much I can show. MRI can show more. Ultrasound can show more. An x-ray is not going to really show um, everything that's improving, all the soft tissue improvement as well. But the other thing is it depends on how advanced your condition is. If you have a more advanced condition, I'm not expecting an x-ray to show a difference. What I'm expecting is a joint that is more stable. That means the ligaments and tendons are stronger. A joint that is less swollen, less inflamed, and less painful, that'll show up on imaging as well. That means that there's less um, inflammation there. And the cells overall are functioning better, which is why you're having less pain and better function. But an x-ray is not going to really show all that. An x-ray is very good for if you're looking for um, how much arthritis you have or, or do you have a fracture, but it doesn't really um, show much else. Another question, do you do a second stem cell injection? If so, how far from the first injection? How successful are they and continue to improve the condition? Thank you, Amnes. This is such a good question. So... The data shows for most people, let's say for me, you'll get at least like five years of improvement. What I tell people is if you have more advanced arthritis, you may need a booster platelet treatment every couple of years or so. Regenix does have some data about what happens if you have to use repeat stem cell treatments. And what you find is the following. For most people, there's going to be slow improvement for the first six to 12 months. At some point, they'll plateau. That could be high. It could be moderate. Like it'll be somewhere in that level. And if there's a little bit of dip, and if you repeat treatment at that point, you're now lifting off from that higher stair step, and you're now kind of going higher than that. And so stair step kind of treatment or a progress and repeat treatment really does make a difference. From what I've seen, the best cases, like people who I thought were poor candidates for treatment, hips or knees, I've seen some surprisingly good improvement when they've actually had like recurrent treatments. In terms of how often to do that, I generally tell people, give it like at least a year. Um, but I do have some cases where people got repeat treatment at like the six month mark and have done really quite impressive, impressively. So some key concepts in regenerative medicine, stability is a key one. Biotensegrity is, is the medical way of saying. It. So tensegrity is the idea that it's an architecture concept that if you take individual units that are weak on their own, if you put them 
in close approximation and then compress them together, you now have a stronger structure. I think intuitively we all understand that. Biotensegrity is this concept in medicine and biology. So prolotherapy is the idea of injecting your own cells into soft tissue supportive structures, such as ligaments or tendons, that will strengthen and stabilize that structure. And if you treat all those different layers that are weakened over time, you get progressive strengthening over time and a longer lasting improvement in treatment as well. This is a really key one because I see a lot of physicians who are doing these kind of treatments, let's say for a knee arthritis, and they'll only inject into the knee joint and they don't treat everything else. And they're missing out on really what's driving a person's problem. So here's a case study of a 71 year old man. He's had prior surgery times two, still having pain, unfortunately. We ended up treating his lower back first with platelets and he had a, had a partial response and escalated to bone marrow and had a, a better response. But the key here to understand is that we treated more than just, let's say, where his nerves are pinched, the epidural space. We treated the ligaments, the facet joints, the muscles, and that epidural space. By treating everything, the whole functional unit that's driving problems, he had a much better improvement than if you only treated, let's say, that one joint or epidural space that, that, that is driving pain. And that's really the beauty of prolotherapy, that by treating the whole functional unit, people do dramatically better than if you only treat one structure that may be causing pain. Orthobiologics, these are the cells and tissues that we inject into a damaged area. So this uses a normal healing process. Please use your own cells, don't use someone else's. Platelets are really the first line orthobiologic after an injury I mentioned before. Platelets come in, they stimulate your local stem cells, utilizing inflammation that helps to repair tissue damage. So there's different types of platelet preparations that we do. Again, I have colleagues where they do a one-size-fits-all kind of platelet preparation. That's a mistake. You need to have flexibility in this. Platelets are, are prepped by first doing a blood draw, centrifuging, and concentrating it. Uh, we use a much higher concentration if you've got arthritic issues, a moderate concentration if you've got tendon issues, a lower concentration if you've got nerve issues. The picture on the right is of different types of platelet preparation. We tend to prefer the one that is amber or yellow-colored one because you've gotten rid of the red blood cells, it's less inflammatory. Your physician should have the flexibility of creating what type of platelet product, depending on what type of problem that you have. And if they don't, if they're doing it as a one-size-fits-all process, they're lacking some of the sophistication then. So this is a example of platelets um, for an individual with knee tendonitis. He was referred to me, he's a 45-year-old man, cyclist, referred to me by his sports medicine doctor because he had persistent pain in his, in his um, patellar tendonitis on MRI due to, um, due to activity. And he had persistent pain despite physical, physical um, therapy and reducing his activity. And so um, referred to see if platelet-rich platinum would be a good um, option for him. So in this case, um, the picture on the right is an ultrasound. This, this very hyperlucent um, structure here, that's the kneecap. That's the knee tendon, uh, that's the patellar tendon. And as you get closer to where the tendon inserts into the kneecap, you have these extra kind of calcifications. That's all consistent with patellar tendonitis. So in his case, we ended up doing PRP. He had two treatments. First treatment gave him um, partial response. The second treatment really kind of got him over the hump. And he was able to get back to physical activity, cycling. I then saw him three years later, now treating his other leg, where he now had a hamstring injury. Again, PRP, pain resolved, back to activity. Picture on the right is an ultrasound. Again, that's the kneecap. That's the tendon. This is where he's got tendonitis. That's the needle. This is zoomed in, obviously. And this is the needle tip where we're injecting platelets directly where the tissue is damaged. So this is a great example of where um, number one, platelets worked out really well in his case. Number two is how repeat treatment actually gave him an even better response and how um, using treatment again a few years later for another injury really gave him a good response. So the next type of orthobiologic to talk about are your own stem cells. These are the main cells that drive tissue repair after an injury. Again, use your own cells, not someone else's. Bone marrow stem cells are legal in the United States if used for orthopedic or musculoskeletal conditions. Fat stem cells are not considered legal in the US because there's an enzyme that you need to use to free up the, the, the cells from the fat. 
And so that is considered unsafe by the FDA for humans. So that is illegal in the United States. You can use fat or adipose. If you're not utilizing that enzyme, you can use that for more structural support. We'll use that for tendon tears along with your own platelets or, or um, stem cells. Um, but strictly speaking, you know, if you're getting a stem cell treatment, it should be for your own bone marrow. You may have heard about amniotic or umbilical cord cells. You probably don't hear too much about that now. That used to be used a lot a few years ago. There's no living cells in that. The way that's processed, it's an off-the-shelf product. It was being misused, mislabeled by, by clinics that were utilizing this for orthopedic issues. And the Federal Trade Commission and the FDA have kind of clamped down on this. And so you probably don't hear too much about that being used nowadays. IV stem cells, you hear about this in some other countries. Uh, I know some people who swear by this. The reality is that there's no proven benefit for orthopedic conditions. You're better off utilizing your own cells, injecting them into the tissue directly. Um, some of the places that use IV stem cells are using umbilical cord cells or amniotic cells. And, you know, this is all outside the um, United States. You just have to be aware that there may be some safety or regulatory issues there. So some other questions that I get frequently, can we improve pain and function if you've got advanced arthritis? Simple answer is yes, we can, especially in areas like the knee or the back. Can we improve how your x-rays or MRI images look? So if you've got advanced arthritis, I can't reverse the damage that's been building up for decades. There may be things like chronic swelling in the joint, um, uh, swelling in the bones, that, that, that's a sign of damage in the bones or even damage to some of the soft tissue structures like ligaments and tendons. But we can't necessarily get an x-ray to look different. We talked about that before. If you've got a tendon tear, and I'll show some examples, it's less than two centimeters in gap. We can treat that. Same thing with ligament tears. If it's more than that, you're probably better off going for surgery. Post-surgery, especially for tendon tears, you'd benefit by having your own bone marrow cells injected to help make sure that the chance of a repeat tear does not happen. If you've got swelling in arthritic joint, we can improve that. If you've got something called avascular necrosis at a early to moderate stage, we can treat that as well. So the keys really are give patients reasonable and appropriate expectations to give them a sense of what's possible. So can we treat bone-on-bone -bone arthritis? This term bone-on-bone -bone is really a misnomer by some physicians. You hear that used a lot for knee arthritis, and yet a person may still have a fully range of motion in their knee, so it's really not bone on bone. Really, you know, for the most part, yes, we can treat advanced arthritis. Arthritis is a biologic condition, treatable with orthobiologic treatment, especially if your range of motion and function are still intact. Caveats are the following. Number one, your expectation should be of pain and functional improvement, not necessarily improving imaging if you're at a more advanced arthritis level. And number two is if you've got advanced hip osteoarthritis, we'll generally recommend people go for surgery for that just because that is a harder issue to treat. Okay, let me just catch up with a couple more questions here. Does your process help stiff knees? Yeah, uh, obviously we want to know why do you have stiff knees? Do you have a structural issue? Do you have chronic inflammation? Um, but yeah. Uh, as a treatment for, for knee arthritis or knee issues, platelets or bone marrow stem cells are a great option. And probably knees are the one area where we get the most consistent result. Well, PRP treatments more than once within a year, the stem cell help, are, are they common? You know, I generally recommend you should give some time in between treatment. So I don't like the idea of sort of um, repeating treatment too quickly. I, I don't think that's the right way to do things. I think you have to give people a chance to heal. So if someone's had a bone marrow stem cell treatment, I think you should really get minimum six months to see how they're doing before considering a platelet booster. Uh, and if possible, even 12 months. For platelets, I think you have to give it at least three to six months. So I think if you've had a stem cell treatment, you know, you probably might need a booster PRP treatment. If, you're, if your response is kind of plateaued a little bit early, I'd be surprised if you needed two platelet treatments, but you know, one treatment would not be surprising. So can tendon and ligament tears be treated? Absolutely. So this is kind of a cool case of um, an ACL tear, a ligament tear. And, you know, for partial thickness tears, definitely we can treat those and improve those. For full thickness tears, you know, when you think about a full thickness tear, you're thinking that the ends are no longer continuous. There may still be some connection, all right? But if you've got like a tear that's fully pulled apart, then that really should go for surgery. 
Again, post-surgery, think about getting your own bone marrow to augment that tear. But if you've got a full thickness tear, but the ends are still close to each other, and not retracted, that's still treatable. So this is a case of a 20-year-old man. He's a butcher playing recreational volleyball. He had an ACL tear. I saw him a couple months later, and we did. We utilized his own bone marrow stem cells. At the three-month mark after treatment, no pain, restarting dynamic exercise, doing great in PT. He's doing great now as well, by the way. And I'll show you his images in a moment. So the picture on the right, our image is an image of his, an x-ray image of his procedure. So in his case, we injected into his ACL. So this is an x-ray image. That's his thigh bone, shin bone. That's a kneecap. This is the needle. And what's lighting up here is his ACL as we're injecting into it. So this is a tissue that's deep enough where you really only know if you're hitting it correctly by by uh, through an x-ray image like this. This is a high level procedure. And um, the reason why you need to be so precise is to get this kind of result. So he had not only a great clinical result, but this is his MRI result as well. So picture on the left is his pre-treatment MRI, kneecap, thigh bone, shin bone, here's the ACL right here, intact on the bottom. As you go higher up, very hazy, very difficult to make out, all right? The radiologists have read this as likely a full thickness tear. Picture on the right, this is ACL now. You see a ligament that is fully intact. And the radiologists have read this as intact. It's linear, it's a clear structure. That is an outstanding result. So he had not only a great clinical result in terms of pain relief and functional improvement, he had a great imaging result as well. It's another kind of cool imaging result. This is a individual, this is a He's a 57-year-old man. He's a contractor, general contractor, does a lot of work above his head. And he came to me with a rotator cuff here, right? So this is an ultrasound image on the left, pre-treatment. That's the bone, the humerus. That's part of the rotator cuff tendon. This right here is the tear on the bottom. That is the tear. That, that is a legit full thickness tear. So he ended up getting treated, treated with his own bone marrow stem cells. And this is his MRI image three months later. So that's the in, intact rotator cuff. That's the healing rotator cuff, where you previously saw that big hole, black hole there, you now have that filled in with tissue. And that is exactly what we want. So he's had, again, he's doing great clinically in terms of back to work, back to overhead activity, and his ultrasound imaging is thing of beauty as well. So interventional orthopedics is the idea of using image guidance to treat orthopedic injuries. And that really includes using ultrasound and x-ray guidance. So these are some more shoulder examples. Picture on the left, just to show you like what, why, like why do we need to use image guidance? So this is uh, on the left is an ultrasound image. That's the bone. That's the supraspinatus tendon. That's the needle. There's a tiny little gap right here. That is, that is less than, uh, that's probably about a one millimeter by one millimeter of size and tear. To do this blindly, just by kind of palpating the skin, impossible or very, very, um, be very, very rare to hit the right target. To inject cells, you can't be close to the target, you have to be exactly at the target. And so we're able to deliver cells exactly in China. Picture on the right is an X-ray image of a shoulder. That's a shoulder joint right there. That's the needle. So we inject, we end up injecting cells into a shoulder joint. We know we're in the right spot because we can see cell layering out with contrast here. We also treated his labrum, and you know that because that's a triangular structure. And that, that's how we define where the labor is. So to do these, again, blindly, very inconsistent, to do these with image guidance is fantastic, very reliable. Picture on the left, I showed this before, this is a propeller tendon that was being injected. Picture on the right, that's an x-ray image for an ACL in, um, injection. Some more kind of case studies. This is a 41-year-old man, he's a He's a chef, stands on his feet for about 13 hours per day, came to me with osteoarthritis, chronic inflammation, and avascular necrosis. So in that ankle. So in his ankle, he's got narrow, that's this MRI image on the left. That's his pretreatment MRI. He's got narrowing of the joint space. He's got a little bit of fluid. He's got swelling in the bone consistent with avascular necrosis. If we don't treat this, that avascular necrosis, swelling the bone will eventually permanently damage the bone, 
erode the bone and then damage the cartilage and cause dramatically worse wear and tear arthritis. So he received stem cell treatment protocol. Again, this is now three months later, right? Joint looks, the prior swelling is gone. Prior avascular necrosis is resolved. He's doing great. He's 90% improved. He's now actually several years out and it's over 95% improved and just doing wonderful. So that that's again, a great case for how we can improve things. Regenerative medicine treatments offer safe and effective solutions for your pain. Great, somebody asking a question. If you're almost 70 years old, can you use your bone marrow cells from the hips? So to be clear, you're asking, can we take bone marrow cells from your iliac crest? That's the back of the pelvic bone. It's not actually the hip. And then use that. Yes, you can. All right, that's what the data shows. If you're asking, if you're 70 years old, can we treat your hip arthritis? That might be a little bit harder. It depends on how much hip arthritis you have. You may be a harder candidate. But in terms of the viability and effectiveness of your own bone marrow stem cells, does not matter your age. It'd be great if we were all 18 years old forever. It's not how life works. But um, using your own cells, you can still get a good result. Depends on what area that we're treating. But um, uh, your age does not limit you from getting this kind of treatment. If you're still otherwise healthy, this is still a great treatment. Somebody asking, can you use treatment on individual toes or arthritis? Big toe is swollen, not much pain, but hard to fit. Yeah, absolutely. If it's pain, yeah. If it's if it's swelling that's in the joint, let's say um, fluid in the joint, yeah, we can definitely treat that. If it's that the toe has sort of deformed over time and now there's some fixed deformities, I, I'm probably not going to be able to reverse that deformity. But if it's if it's more a matter of pain and function and chronic inflammation, we can treat that. So it depends on what's really causing the uh, the enlargement. Again, to learn more about what we're doing, you can go to chicagoarthritis.com. So is this good, too good to be true? There's evidence from Philip Hernigue, French orthopedic surgeon since the mid-1990s. The Regenics Network, they have data that goes back to 2005. While this field is rapidly developing, it's not. I have personal experience since 2008. I have colleagues who five years ago, 10 years ago, they said they thought this didn't work at all. Five years ago, they were up in the air and now they'll tell patients, maybe it helps or not exactly sure. You know, if you're, if you're not aware of the data, if you're not aware of the, the studies on this, if you're not experienced in these kind of treatments, then you may not know the right and the wrong ways to do this. And you may not be able to guide patients correctly. So I think the keys are, this is not too good to be true. Make sure your results are, or your expectations are grounded in reality and evidence-based medicine. But these, these are really cutting edge and these can certainly help most of our patients. How long do results last? Regenix has data that goes 10 plus years of effectiveness. Philip Hernigu has data that goes over 20 years. What I tell people, and, and there are studies out there that kind of reliably say, um, let's say a stem cell treatment for like a knee, for example, expect at least five years improvement. You may need a platelet treatment every so often. If you get a platelet-rich plasma treatment, expect two years of improvement. You may need one or two treatments, but that those are realistic expectations. Again, people vary a little bit. Some people do better. Some people do a little bit worse. What I tell people is for a chronic condition, expect you'll probably need a repeat treatment at some point. That may be a few years after the initial treatment. That, that's being conservative and um, I think realistic. Best way to maintain results after treatment, improve your biomechanics. That's what caused this problem to begin with, right? Either it's um, uh, maintain an ideal body weight or there may be some instability. There may be some other structural issues. Correct everything you can. Use the appropriate joint supplements that we know that help with pain and inflammation. Again, repeat treatment. I mentioned this, right? We set you at a higher level. A repeat treatment is now building off that higher level, stair step wise. Maintain ideal body weight as much as possible. It'll reduce stress on the lower back and legs. It'll improve your metabolic health and inflammation. All that is key. You know, we happen to have a physician assisted weight loss program where we utilize semi-glutide. I think that's going to make a huge difference for a lot of our patients who are dealing with lower extremity and lower back arthritis as well. So do all that stuff to help maintain your results afterwards. Cost, always a very important question. Not routinely covered by insurance. 
there are some exceptions. Regenix has 2,000 plus self-insured companies that are currently covering this. To learn more about that, go to regenixcorporate.com. Cost estimates in the U.S. if this is out of pocket, however, are there. Dextrose prolotherapy about 750, PRP about 2,500, stem cells about 7,000. Keys to determine value. Number one, make sure your physician and clinic are regenerative medicine experts. We talked about that. Make sure you're receiving a real stem cell treatment, not something mislabeled like amniotic or umbilical cord treatment. These are in-office procedures, right? So you can avoid hospital and surgery center fees if those are there as well. Again, what makes a regenerative medicine expert? So many things, right, to do this properly. To be a proper expert in anything, you have to be 100% in and doing this properly. I think if you do all that, the chance of getting a good result is still high. A little bit more about how we do things here at Chicago Arthritis. Focus on non-surgical treatments for your arthritis, tendonitis, injuries, and back pain. Evaluating you initially for inflammation, instability, asymmetry, neuromuscular issues. Correcting with low-risk interventions if you've not done anything yet. If not working, then progressing to regenerative medicine treatments. Utilizing the best products possible for you from your own body. Plan that's tailored to your specific problem, not a one-size-fits-all process. And then injecting those with the highest level of image guidance possible as well. How to get evaluated. If you look on the chat section, you'll see there's three different ways to schedule with us. You can call, you can email, you can even directly go into our scheduling, our schedule and schedule with us as well. Someone asking, okay, someone asking about Medicare and supplemental, about percentage to cover. Medicare does not routinely cover this. The government is still trying to figure this out. Um, there's a government insurance called TRICARE that will cover PRP for knees and elbows. Medicare does not know how to cover this at this point, unfortunately. Well, thank you everyone for your time. We're coming toward the end of our time today. Good question, so we ask a good question. Any last questions, please start putting them in right before we need to end. So I'm gonna ask about, will these treatments work on spinal stenosis and sciatica? Absolutely, again, need to review imaging, what's going on and all that, but um, spinal stenosis, absolutely. And the key is you have to treat the whole functional unit. And in something like spinal stenosis, it means not only treating where the nerve is being pinched, treat the facetulants that are being overloaded, treat the ligaments, that are there to support the actual spine as well. And then there's, there's in particular in spinal stenosis is one particular ligament called the ligament, the flavum ligament, that's right next to the nerves, right next to the epidural space, um, uh, next to the spinal cord that gets stressed. And if it gets stressed and hypertrophied or thickened, it starts to cause pressure on, on, the, on the spinal canal. And that's what spinal stenosis is. And absolutely, we can treat that as well. Good. Well, so everyone, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate everyone and um, for listening and for the questions. If we can be of additional assistance, please contact us from any of the ways that we're available. And if we do connect in the future, I hope that we can help you out. And until then, I hope everyone has a good day and lives well. Bye-bye.